get started in uh Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Jim Zarin, president of City Club, and I welcome you all, those of you here at the Governor Hotel, and also those of you listening on OPB Radio, and watching on cable television. We, we're glad you are with us for our program today on this Friday, the 20th of June, 2008. Our program today features a presentation by the Director of Portland Parks and Recreation, who will address the richness of Portland's park system and the challenges of managing parks resources and distributing them equitably in a city like Portland. Before we begin our program, however, a few announcements. First, in consideration of those sitting next to you and our radio and television audiences, those in the room, please silence your cell phones and anything else that's likely to make noise. Join us here next week, uh, next Friday, when the program will feature a debate on the I-5 Columbia River Bridge issue. It's only $4.2 billion. Uh, featuring Rex Burkholder, a member of the Metro Council, and Joe Courtright, a local economist. It promises to be a very engaging and informative program on a major issue facing the cities of Portland and Vancouver, the bi-state region, and both the states of Oregon and Washington. That's here next week. City Club has great partners in presenting these Friday forums. In fact, these Friday forums would not be possible without the generous support of our corporate sponsors. This quarter sponsors are West Coast Bank, City Center Parking, the law firm of Stoll Reeves LLP, and Neil Kelly Company. We thank them all for their support. And I'm particularly pleased that joining us today is the president and CEO of corporate sponsor, Neil Kelly Company, and a City Club member, Tom Kelly. Tom, please stand up and be recognized. A few other announcements. First, Citizen Salons. This Sunday, June 22nd, we kick off City Club's popular Citizen Salon Summer Dinner and Discussion Series with a conversation about Oregon's initiative system featuring Attorney General and former Speaker of the House, Hardy Myers. Uh, we have two new City Club members with us today, and I'd like to have them stand and be recognized. First is Danielle Colana, who's project manager at BrainBridge Designs, and second is Janet Grayson, attorney at Maylee and Grayson. Please stand. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, next Tuesday evening, June 24th, uh, we will have a second Citizen Salon. This one will address the topic of race, the haunting of America. And this dinner discussion will feature Tom Spanbauer, author of the book, Far Away Places. And it'll be hosted by Leslie Lewis at the Ace Hotel. It's not too late to sign up for this Citizen Salon next Tuesday. Please consider uh, these and other exciting Citizen Salons through the summer. They are listed in your City Club Bulletin. We have a full schedule for both July and August. They're on some very interesting topics and in, uh, involving some very interesting and provocative people. If you're interested, please uh, make a reservation by contacting the City Club office. Please know that the next City Club Long-Term Study Committee report was released this week as part of the upcoming City Club Bulletin that you'll all receive. The title of the study is Enhancing Portland's Business Environment, a Public-Private uh, Enterprise. The club will be hosting a town hall meeting on this new report next Wednesday, June 25th at 5.15 p.m. at the City Club Commons. All are welcome. And City Club members will vote on this report here at the Friday Forum on June 27th. Be advised that the City Club Research Board is now recruiting volunteers to serve on ballot measure study committees heading towards November's election. The commitment for one of these studies lasts about eight weeks, beginning in late July and ending with presentations right here at the Friday Forum uh, in September or October. Uh, these ballot measure study committees are a great way to get involved in City Club and the public process. You will form memorable and lasting bonds with other study committee members. You will learn a lot about the issue involved and you'll make a contribution to the public's well-being and it'll take you two months and you'll be done. So if you've never done anything like this uh, and you've thought about it, please consider doing it. 
and you'll help continue City Club's 92-year tradition of citizen-driven research reports. Again, if you're interested, contact the City Club staff. Applications are due by July 3rd. And now to our program. The City Parks Forum, a project of the Amer American Planning Association, has recently produced a series of briefing papers on how healthy parks are fundamental to many aspects of the prosperity of a city. Indeed, the briefing papers produced by the City Parks Forum include treatises addressing how prosperous cities use parks for community engagement, for community revitalization, for economic development, to create safer neighborhoods, to provide green infrastructure, to help children learn, to improve public health, to provide arts, and to promote smart growth. These ideas are not new to us here in Portland, where our cities and regions, parks and green spaces are loved and valued and heavily used and are a key part of what make Portland and this region special from other places. But providing and maintaining a healthy park system in a city like Portland is not easy. In fact, although our park system is a subject of great value and pride, it also is an ongoing challenge to manage. To help us understand both the richness and value of the city of Portland's parks and the challenges in managing it for the benefit of all, we are pleased to have as our featured speaker today the current director of Portland Parks and Recreation. Our speaker lived her first 21 years in Iran. She graduated from Tehran University with a BS in horticulture and later earned her master's in landscape architecture from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. During the first 10 years of her career, she worked in the private sector, but after moving to Portland in 1980, she began work in the public sector with the Planning and Development Department of Portland Parks and Recreation. In 1994, she was named manager of the implementation of the $66 million parks bond measure passed by Portland voters. And in that capacity, she distinguished herself by successfully managing 114 projects at 99 different sites within the city and bringing all of them in on time and within budget. Our guest was also a champion within City Hall of the idea for a linear park or walkway along the east bank of the Lamont River. Standing strong in that capacity through years of challenges, she helped lead the opening of the east bank esplanade with thousands of appreciative citizens in 2001. Now, in major part because of this history of success within City Hall and the Bureau, our guest was named the first female director of Portland Parks and Recreation in 2003, a position she still holds today. Now for the sort of human interest side of our guest's background, I want to retell a story that I heard about Zeri uh, several years ago, but she confirmed for me this week. Now, in the fall of 1969, a few months after she had come to the United States, she decided she was interested in the combination of horticulture, her bachelor's training, and urban design. And so she uh, went to the offices of the Landscape Architecture Program at Harvard in Boston to pick up application materials in the hope that she could be admitted the following fall. However, when she arrived at the offices, it happened to be lunchtime, and so the offices were closed. So she decided to sit nearby and wait for the offices to reopen after lunch. And as it turned out, uh, there was a, a man sitting next to her, about 40 years old or, or so, and uh, he was eating his lunch, and they struck up a conversation. And he asked if she was a student, and she explained that she wasn't, but she was there to get uh, application materials uh, for the School of Design uh, for the Landscape Architecture Program, hoping to enroll the following fall. And he could tell she had an accent, and he asked her questions about where she, she was from and her family and her background, and why she was interested in landscape architecture and in the program, and why Harvard. And it was a pleasant diversion as she waited for the offices to reopen. And when they did, she and the gentleman parted ways, and she said goodbye, and then she went in and got her application materials and sub subsequently submitted them. However, as the months rolled on, it got to be January and February, and she didn't hear anything from the program, and she figured that she had simply not made it in. And a major part she thought that is she knew that applicants were required to go through an interview process, and she hadn't had an interview, much less even heard back from the program. But then one day in February, she received an envelope, and it turned out that it told her that she had been not only admitted to the program, but had been offered a scholarship. And she was quite stunned and was trying to figure out how this could happen, especially since she hadn't had an interview. And she called the office and talked to somebody there, and they finally explained to her that she indeed had had an interview. Because the man in his 40s that she had talked with that day turned out to be, you guessed it, he was the chair of the program uh, at the Harvard School of Design and the Architecture program. 
So the rest, as they say, is history, and I guess the lesson for us all is be careful who you're talking to while you're waiting for an office to open during lunch. So please give a warm City Club welcome to the Director of Portland Parks and Recreation, Zary Santner. Not only Jim gave half of my speech, he took my speech with him. Good, <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, you know, when I talked to Jim yesterday, uh, afterwards I remembered that a few years ago I went back for my 35th anniversary uh, to Harvard. And there was a reception and I saw Chuck Harris, the chair, the old chair of the department. He was in his early 80s. So I went to him and I said, hi Chuck, I'm sure you don't remember me. I, and he stopped me and he said, I certainly remember you Zary. I never forget the lively conversation that we had where you were admonishing the uh, officials of the city to call Harvard Square a square. That's a misnomer. It's not a square, it's a crossroad. So we had a quite a bit of lively discussion about that. Anyway, I'm very, very pleased to be here today to talk to you about our park system. Summer is here, finally, both uh, in terms of calendar and as uh, the weather is showing outside. And as you know, summer months are very busy months for parks professionals. This week, hundreds of young children, many of them your children or grandchildren, are learning to swim in our pools. Our summer parks, uh, summer programs and day camps are bursting with activities. There are weddings in Washington parks, festivals in waterfront parks, juvenile herons learning to fish Mike Houck in Oaks Bottom. Summer is here and is happening in our parks. I truly feel honored that I manage a park system that is a significant contributor to Portland's reputation as one of the top 10 livable cities in our country. This wonderful city that we enjoy was built by people who look to the future, way beyond the horizon of possibilities. It took the boldness of inspired leaders to set aside the first park blocks, and later the forest track of land that became Forest Park, the nation's largest urban forest. We are all beneficiaries of their rich legacy of investing in green spaces and a tradition of civic engagement. Our job is to learn from that history and to leave it as a gift for our children. So <clears throat> today, I want to give you a picture of our park's futures. What's good, what's lacking, and what we all need to do to make sure that we continue this legacy. At the turn of the 20th century, many people in this crowd, I'm sure, are aware that the famed Olmsted brothers came to Portland to lay the foundation for a comprehensive park system. John Charles Olmsted, the author of the plan, at that time argued that if Portland wanted to join the League of civilized and progressive cities and help to improve the health and business prosperity of its citizens, it must have a comprehensive system of parks, plazas, natural areas connected by trails and parkways. A hundred years later, the prosperity, livability, and progressiveness of Portland is a testament to the validity of Olmsted's vision. So, at the beginning of 21st century, the question is whether we will preserve and build on this legacy that was bestowed on us by our visionary forebears. 
And the answer is an emphatic yes. And I want to share with you our plans for extending this legacy for the enjoyment of the future generation. And I also want to ask for your help. Let me invoke a word that we all love in this city, livability. The word livability is nearly synonymous with Portland. The city annually makes the list of nations, and in fact, world's best places, and rightfully so. But what is livability? Um, the definitions vary. But one attribute common to all livable cities are great parks. So in a city that recently was recognized in New York Times as a cool place to live, work, and play, how do our parks and recreation programs benefit Portland's livability? Let me take just a few minutes to elaborate on the benefits of parks. I know Jim covered some of it. But first, let's try to get a picture in our mind's eye of the sheer size and scope of our parks, recreational facilities, natural areas, and trails. Did you know that Portland Park System comprises 10% of Portland's land? We have 254 parks from petunia size Milan's Park to Colossal Forest Park, in which you can fit more than six New York City central parks. We have 177 miles of trails, and that number is growing. We have facilities for arts, community centers, community schools in over 50 locations that receive more than 5 million visits each year. Our natural areas feature forests, meadows, wetlands, stream and river banks that account for 7,000 protected acres. This wonderful system of green infrastructure benefits Portlanders in innumerable ways. But let me list just six of them for you today. One, parks protect our air, land, and water for a healthy environment. Just look at our trees alone. Portland's urban forest and tree canopy removes 53 million pounds of carbon, nearly 2 million pounds of pollutants from Portland's air supply, and it saves us over $36 million in stormwater processing costs annually. Two, parks and parks program improve the physical and psychological health of our community. One of three American adults is overweight. The rate of childhood obesity and diabetes is increasing. Parks offer an antidote to our increasingly sedentary, plugged in, and unhealthful lifestyle. Three, our parks and recreation programs contribute to a family-friendly city that enables family to play together, build community, and stay active. Four, as Jim mentioned, investing in parks is good business. Great parks deliver economic benefits by attracting new businesses, lowering health care costs, increasing employment opportunity, boosting employee productivity, making Portland a tourist attraction and raise property value. A recent study at Reed College demonstrated that our public parks significantly increase the value of properties within 1,500 feet of a park. 
Five, par parks means jobs. I bet you did not know that Portland Parks is the largest employer of youth in Portland. Six, and finally, what we all love about parks is that they are places where we come together as a community to go to concert in parks, watch movies, go to farmer's market, play or watch sports, or just simply hang out and enjoy the beautiful green spaces. These places and activities knit us together as a community that connects across culture, generations, and economic differences. So given these benefits, what are we doing to make sure that our parks thrive? What is the plan for the future, you may ask? A good question. And over 100 years after Olmsted Plan, it's the one that we ask ourselves when once again we gathered to develop a vision for the future. In 2001, a team of committed citizens, including Jim Zarin, your president, joined with us to create a vision to protect Portland's park system, to make recreational services equitable, and to leave a legacy for future. By, by the year 2020, Portland's population, region's population, is expected to grow by more than half a million, and 70,000 of whom are expected to be our neighbors in Portland. To sustain our parks and to ensure a legacy for the future, the Parks 2020 Vision Plan focused on three critical elements, access, nature, and connections. Seven years later, I want to touch on progress we're making to date. Vision 2020 recommends that all citizens have equitable access to a variety of high quality and recreation services. To this end, it calls for a park within half a mile or 10 to 15 minute walking distance of all Portlanders. This goal translates to adding more than 1,870 acres of uh, natural areas and parkland by the year 2020. The greatest needs lie, lies in areas that are home to low-income minority and new immigrants, such as, in neighborhoods such as Cali, Arge, and Centennial. Since the adoption of the plan, we have purchased more than 530 acres of natural areas and 125 acres of land for developed parks across the city, but primarily in the east um, neighborhoods, east side neighborhoods. The plan also envisions adding f six full service community centers. We have expanded two of our existing community centers to become full service and have purchased the land for a third one in the old Washington Monroe site. One of uh, Portland's distinguishing characteristics that you hear a lot from Jim Zarin is that many of our neighborhoods have their own commercial centers and the 2020 plan calls for building plazas in regional and town centers so that they could become neighborhood living rooms where activities such as farmer's market and cultural celebration can happen. We built Jameson Square in the Pearl, but we need to do many more, to, uh, many more of these lively plazas in the heart of neighborhoods such as Hillsdale, St. John's, Hollywood, or Gateway. Fortunately for us, and thanks to our commissioner, a recently passed park system development charge for commercial development gives us the financial tools to buy land and build these plazas, and we're very, very anxious to get going on this. The second element of 2020 is nature, and that is to provide nature in the city. 
Three years ago, we created a new department of city nature in the Bureau, charged with the protection and maintenance of the health of our natural areas, urban canopy, and to connect people to nature. Our natural area acquisition strategy focuses on seeking, purchasing, and protecting large tract of sustainable lands and exceptional habitats. These are the last best places in Portland. If they're not protected now, they will be lost forever. As an example, I'm extremely excited about a possibility which um, there are several people in the city are very critical to achieving this. And two of them are sitting here, Gail Kelly and Dean Marriott. And that possibility is the idea of connecting, of, of creating a forest park of the east side. By connecting through purchase the pristine natural areas of the East Buttes while protecting and extending the riparian corridor of Johnson Creek. With the updated system development charge for parks, metros, green spaces, bond, and Mayor-elect Sam Adams's great green initiatives, bureaus of parks, environmental services, and metro will have the financial ability to really make this dream come true. The third element of 2020 plan is connection, and that is connecting people to people, people to nature, and building community. For adults locally and nationally, two most popular outdoor activities are biking and walking. In fact, uh, I think a few weeks ago, we, Portland, Portland was recognized as one of the top 10 most walkable cities in the country. We always make the list of top 10. We are now working, um, actually, we, Portland Parks was one of the pioneers of the Rails to Trails initiative by, work, by our work on Spring Water Corridor, which connects downtown Portland to Gresham and beyond. We are now working on the Greenway Trail in um, South Waterfront and the Wad Bluff Trail in the Overlook neighborhood. We also have developed plans which await funding for Bridgeton Trail in North Portland and Red Electric Trail. This is a very, very important trail because by connecting to Fano Creek, it will connect Beaverton and beyond to the Willamette River <clears throat> at Willamette Park. <clears throat> Excuse me. So many fear that when plans are developed, they sit on shelves and collect dust. That's not the case with Park's 2020 plan. As you've heard, we've made steady progress to achieve its major goals. Much credit goes to the 14 members of the Portland Parks Board who are the champion on this effort. The Parks Board, the establishment of Parks Board as a policy advisory committee was one of the first step recommendation of the 2020 and many of the members of the Parks Board are here, and Jim Zarin is one of the founding members of the Portland Parks Board. In addition to our very active board, we believe there are other factors, <coughs> excuse me, there are other factors that are contributing to our progress and success. They include the quality and composition of our workforce, fiscal responsibility, innovation, and partnership. First, I want to touch on work, our workforce. Our workforce is unique in that our professional, talented, full-time staff performs only 50% of the work in the Bureau. An additional 1,500 seasonal employees perform another 25% of the work particularly in the peak 
months of summer. But most remarkably, the last quarter of the work in the Bureau is performed by thousands of volunteers, and many of you are amongst them, who provide volunteer services for us. The volunteer hours of our 16,000 volunteers constitute 460,000 hours, which is, which is valued at $5 million annually, and it's an equ equivalent of 220 full-time employees. So it is a remarkable and important asset for the Bureau. Second, we're very, very careful how we spend our public dollars, and we leverage them at every opportunity. You may recall that five years ago, we faced a $2 million budget gap, which resulted in temporary reduction of some services and programs. I say temporary because you all help, helped us pass a five-year, $50 million levy in November of 2002, which restored those services. The levy funds were absolutely necessary to provide basic services, uh, such as safe places to play and recreation programs for children, adults, and seniors. It also included a few capital improvement programs, uh, projects, such as the renovation of Wilson Pool Swimming Pool, which was completed three years ago, and for the first time, an indoor swim center east of 82nd Avenue at the East Portland Community Center, which will open this fall. We also added three new skate parks, one more than promised by the levy, thanks to funds that we were able to leverage, and we expanded the University Park Community Center in the New Columbia neighborhood. And through a very innovative partnership with the Housing Authority of Portland and Rosa Parks Elementary School, the Boys and Girls Club, we have been able to maximize the use of those facilities to serve more children before and after a school than each could do individually. I am very, very happy to announce to you that your next tax bill does not include a levy charge. Thanks to Commissioner Salzman and the members of City Council, these wonderful programs that were funded by the levy are not going to disappear beginning of fiscal year in 10 days. The budget that was adopted on June 4th replaces levy dollars with ongoing general fund dollars. This means that we do not have to come back to you every five year for levies to have core and basic services done in the Bureau. The third factor essential The third factor essential to our success is continuously seeking innovations, efficiencies, and improvements in our management practices. Um, take our nationally recognized quest for sustainability, for example. Portland Parks and Recreation is the first park system in the nation that has been certified as a salmon safe organization, and we're very, very proud of that. Fourth and finally, and perhaps most important factor in our success is our proactive strategy to seek partners, both public and private, to deliver quality services. For instance, nearly 80 friends group provide much to make our parks great. Groups like Forest Park Conservancy, Friends of Community Music Center, Hoyt Arboretum Friends, Friends of Leech Garden, Friends of Woodstock Community Centers. They run programs, manage facilities, build trails, build other amenities in our parks, gardens, and natural areas, and they raise money. 
are active programs with all five public school districts in Portland expand lessons beyond the classrooms and into the living laboratories found in our parks. Metro, as I mentioned before, is a key partner in acquiring and preserving some of our natural areas. Partnering with Portland Development Commissions in 11 urban renewal areas supplements our fund to renovate existing parks and build new ones. We are very, very proud of our partnership with Bureau of Envi Environmental uh, Services, and we have been, made tremendous progress in protection of watersheds and controlling invasive species. Our partnership with Multnomah County to deliver Sun Community Schools program is a nationally recognized program and it's a model for agency col collaborations in other cities. Meanwhile, in the private sector, we can now offer generous individuals and businesses a menu of programs and projects available for sponsorship. This will give us the ability to stretch our public dollars so we can deliver better services to you. Some new ex few uh, recent examples include Daimler AG. In the past three years, they have fully funded summer concerts in Washington Park. They joined more than 30 other sponsors of summer concerts and movies in parks all over the city. Recently, Trailblazers and Fred Myers have joined to establish a children's garden in Woodlawn Park to provide after school and summer weekly sessions of gardening for children. Neil Kelly Company and Rejuvenation Companies have joined um, to make it possible to build an accessible uh, ramp for the first time in nearly 100 years to allow people with mobility problems to get close and smell the roses at Peninsula Park. And a partnership deserving special acknowledgement is Portland Parks Foundation. The foundation's effort in the past seven years has inspired donations of more than $8 million from generous businesses and individuals, which has paid for capital improvements such as buying land and building a new park in a park deficient neighborhood and over $500,000 of scholarships for youth and families to use uh, to participate in parks activities. Last, but certainly not least, many of you out there, as I mentioned, are our partners. The 16,000 volunteers do much to make our parks and our facilities great. Many of you listening today are among our dedicated stewards. If you ever help on a soccer team, pulled ivy in Forest Park, picked up litter in parks, served on a committee, planning committee, or inoculated elm trees for Dutch elm disease, you are our partners. We appreciate and we need your continued involvement. As you've heard, we have much to be happy about and thankful for. But at the risk of dimming this rosy picture of your park system, I must tell you that one of the most well-regarded park system in the country, namely yours, faces numerous challenges, but nothing that we cannot collectively overcome. As you heard, my family is from Iran. Uh, when I first became parks director, my father told me that this was an enormous responsibility. Not because it was a big job, but because Portland is blessed with its assets in the park system that it has. He said your biggest challenge would be to not allow complacency to set in the minds of Portlanders. But it could also be your best gift to the park system and to the city of Portland. My father's words 
rings true for me almost every day. We cannot afford to be complacent. There are inequities in our services. 20% of families still live more than half a mile or 15 minute walk of a park. We need to develop the parklands we've purchased so that we could make progress in reducing this inequity. We need to offer programs that make all people feel welcome, regardless of age, ethnicity, or culture. We need to address the growing concern about obesity and nature deficit disorder in our children. Our children need to learn and value the natural world that surrounds them and be prepared to be good stewards and good citizens. We need to invest in the maintenance facilities for our workers and volunteers. There is serious work to be done. And we have developed, being a good managed bureau, we have developed strategies to respond to these issues. They include diversifying our funding sources, realigning our priorities to meet the future needs, and expanding our partnership and sponsorship opportunities. Financially, our goal is to use our annual allocation of general fund to deliver basic services. For, to grow our system, we will rely, continue to rely heavily on, Portland, as, on park system development charges and partnership opportunities. Periodically, however, we need to come back to you and ask for your support to help pay for major maintenance of existing facilities and new parks and facilities. This fall, we will hold forums in the community about our progress to date, and we will ask community members to help us determine where we should invest in the coming years to get moving on our future needs. The input we'll receive will be very, very essential in developing a comprehensive capital improvement program from which we will develop a general obligation bond package which we would like to bring to the voters, hopefully in 2010. In closing, I hope you will continue to be generous with your time and your resources so we can achieve the park's 2020 vision. We need your help and support if we are to be successful in sustaining Portland Park's reputation and Portland's livability. Please consider this an invitation to anyone who wants to establish what your April speaker, Mark Friedman, called an encore career. If you are contemplating retirement and would like to stay active, we have a place for you in parks. There are limitless opportunities in parks for you to share your talents and share your expertise and help others to have access to our programs and facilities. Help us combine the memories of our elders with the dreams of our children. Go out and get active, but don't go alone. Take along the children in your life and enrich their quality of life by connecting them to nature. Show them that you value the beauty and the benefits of parks, that stewardship is a shared responsibility. I admit I now have a selfish reason wanting to activate people to care. Soon I will become a grandparent. And my first grandchild, and I want my first grandchild to enjoy all the joys that his father and my son had growing up in Portland and playing in Portland parks. I want him to grow up in a great city with great parks. I want him to grow up to be one of next generation's passionate parks partners. Finally, I want to leave you with this thought. I believe, and I hope you do, 
that it is possible in the 21st century to add a park of the size, beauty, and significance of Laurelhurst Park in a neighborhood such as Cully or Centennial. I believe we can enrich the lives of families who will be moving to the affordable neighborhoods of East Portland with access to a nature reserve with as many miles of trails as the last generation left us by protecting Forest Park. We cannot remain complacent if we want to sustain the livability of our city and if we want to be a great city with great parks. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you, Zuri. Our first uh, question of Zuri Santner will be asked by our board host today, John Horvick. John uh, is the project director of the Parents and Children Together study at OHSU. He joined City Club in 2004 <clears throat> after moving here from Minnesota, from whence a lot of good people have come to Portland. Uh, in that short time, he has served not only on the Board of Governors, but as co-chair of the New Leaders Council. He's currently a member of the Research Board and is the Board of Governors liaison to the Re New Leaders Council. John? Uh, first one, shameless plug, uh, New Leaders Council is hosting a citizen salon with Zeri in July at Peninsula Park. And so if you're a supporter of City Club and you're a supporter of the parks, I encourage you to talk to staff or check the website out to get some more information about that. Uh, Zeri, you mentioned Jameson Square, which is by the neighborhood I live in, and it is a great spot. It teams with kids and families during the summer. Um, it's so popular that it seems to have sparked several businesses around it recently. There's a new coffee shop that um, caters specifically to families with kids. There's new um, apparel stores that are specific to kids. There's a new ice cream shop. It's a great place. A couple blocks down the way is Tanner Springs Park, which is, it has lovely landscaping and I suppose is more contemplative than Jamison Square. Um, but it is used by far fewer people and it has been criticized for that. Um, obviously these parks serve different purposes. Yeah, but one has a higher number of users, a much higher number of users. Do you consider both these parks successful? And by what metrics do you make that determination? The answer is yes, they are. You know, when we make parks, particularly like uh, 50 years, 100 years ago, uh, their size was big. And then you had variety of activities in a large, you can do that. You can have places where people gather, you can have places where people can get away and, and enjoy nature and contemplate, and places for kids to play. So when we were developing plan for Pearl, we realized that we were not going to get a big chunk of land. So our approach was that, that we will have several parks but we will try to have for each an element that you will find in a big park. Both areas for respite and contemplations and quiet activities and areas for uh, really what we call active areas. So, and actually this has had its benefits because now we had three parks where it could be surrounded by development, and therefore, uh, increase the value of those properties and increase the tax roll. We saw Jameson as Square exactly as it's functioning, except we didn't think that there would be that many children using it because the district was planned to be uh, a sort of empty nesters um, district. We are delighted that children are coming from all over Portland to use Jameson Square. Tanner Spring is functioning exactly as we wanted it. Uh, and this came out through the planning process by the community members. They wanted something quiet and also something that was more 
uh, akin to, to nature. So we've done that, and I think that uh, if you go there, you see people sitting, reading books, uh, drinking coffees, and having conversations, and it's a very different park. Uh, we now turn to the part of the program where we take questions from uh, the floor. Uh, asking questions is a privilege of City Club membership. Uh, my job at this point is to hold up the dreaded uh, City Club President's question mark, which says if you don't get to one of these in 30 seconds, I hold this up and you experience derision from everybody else in the room. So, Now we have one person lined up. I'm sure there's others in the room that have questions about our park system, so I encourage other people to, uh, to go ahead. But Ted K. Ted K, City Club member. Uh, you mentioned Forest Park, which I believe is close to half of the total acreage of the parks in the city. I'm concerned about the mix of our effort to add parks and our ability to maintain and operate them. I observe uh, much less operating and maintenance support of Forest Park than I think it should get. And I'm wondering if you can comment on how that might come into balance. You know, one of the things that I did not include in my speech, there are so many things to include, but I had only 30 minutes, is um, the funding source for our park system and how much from where. The auditor's office uh, conducts a survey of six comparable cities to Portland, and they've done a com comparison of the budget for Portland parks system, the operating budget, versus other cities. Our budget, our operating budget is $86 per capita compared to $142 per capita in Seattle. We have 10,700 acres. Seattle has less than 6,500. So you are absolutely right. We are short of funding, but as I hope that I illustrate it, we're trying to make it up in other ways, and we will continue to do that. I think it is a struggle for us. How can we continue to provide good services and also meet the needs of people who do not have those services? So our strategy, as I mentioned, we want to focus our general fund monies on basic operations and all the future developments and capital improvements from other sources. My hope is that as our city grows and as these wonderful urban renewal areas contribute to the tax base of the city, and once that tax base gets back to the city, that we will get a good share of it. So. Patty Tillett, City Club member. Um, you spoke, Zari, about the, the squares in the um, Pearl District, but we have a lot of far more urban spaces, and they certainly fulfill a particular um, role in our city. Jan Gels, the well-known Danish commentator, has called Port, uh, uh, Pioneer Courthouse Square the finest urban square in the world, which is quite a, quite a, a, a standard to live up to. I know that you're looking at new urban squares, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the complementary role that those spaces play to the more nature-based parks th that you discussed earlier. Absolutely, and, and that's why Jim Zarin is so forceful <laughs> about us getting that. You, it, I think my explanation about Jameson Square and Tanner Springs is a very good example. example. We need both of them. In our urban commercial centers, we need to have urban areas for people to come together, to enjoy each other, to watch each other, to socialize. But we also need places where we can get away, particularly since um, areas like downtown or our commercial areas will be mixed use and the density will increase. You need relief from that density. So you need to have relief from density, but you also need a place where if you wanted to, you can get away from. So both of them, um, I think are valid. Mike Houck, City Club member. Uh, Jim will indulge me. I would like to, to uh, follow up on your comment about Tanner Springs. The other day I was walking by and an osprey 
actually came down and went into that pond after some of the, I guess, koi are in there or something. So that was, I think, quite a compliment to the designers. Um, you mentioned your partnership with Metro and with uh, BES um, uh, in the headwaters of Johnson Creek. When David Bragdon spoke here not too long ago, um, he referred to the Connecting Green initiative that, that's been launched that you've been part of as well uh, to create the greatest park system in the world. Um, can you expand on how Portland and uh, Portland Parks and other local park providers are cooperating with Metro to, to make that a reality? Well, I think um, I'm proud of the fact that Portland City of Portland and particularly Portland Parks Bureau, it has been a major supporter, a major collaborator with Metro uh, for a long time. In fact, uh, when 95, when they passed their first green spaces budget, we worked with them, we had uh, local shares and we collaborated and that was very successful. So we're looking forward to uh, further collaborations. In this bond measure that was recently passed, we get about, I think, $14 million uh, of that for our local share. I think the value of this collaboration is that we're leveraging dollars. And we ca neither one of us could do everything that needs to be done, but through collab collaborations, we are able to uh, not only preserve uh, incredible habitats, but also in areas that are nature that have nature deficits, bring nature to them through their uh, grant program. So we look forward to that continued relationship and collaborations and is actually essential to our success. Hi, Dick Tracy, a City Club member. Um, today we're joined by a number of tables. Uh, young graduate students are here doing an inter internship for the whole summer from different parts of the uh, country. What can you recommend that they do while they're here in Portland, Portland Park's recreation activities? Activities, bicycling, hiking, swimming, golfing. I forgot to mention we have five municipal golf courses, racing, and you can also help Parks Bureau. <laughs> We have a lot of areas where we can help. And uh, by the way, I know a lot of you are interested in strategic planning, and we are right now are completing our strategic plan that we want to take to the uh, public for the next three years. So come, come over and take a look and uh, critique our plan. Susan Kelly, City Club member. Sari, a few weeks ago I told you I saw a heron at uh, Lawhurst Park at the pond, and I was thrilled because I've... That's been my park, or it was when I was a little kid, and the water's always been so murky and awful. And you described a fascinating um, problem solution to that. Could you share that with the group? Well, um, many of you may know that we have a chronic problem with the quality of water at, uh, in Laurelhurst Park, algae growth and the heat. And last year, it was to the extent that we had to close off the pond to dogs and uh, we don't allow children to go there, but particularly even for dogs. And we asked for a capital improvement funding, which was considerable. We had to dredge more than two feet of sludge that had accumulated in the bottom of that. And we, what we struggled with was how mechanically, how could we do that? And there is an endangered turtle also living in this pond. And finally, one of the things that is just remarkable about our bureau is how innovative our staff are. So one of the staff came and said, well, you know, I'm going to get on the internet and research and find out if there's another solution. And he came up with a sol solution that is very, very sustainable, which is using some um, biological method to to clean this pond. The community members were very apprehensive. They wanted it done. And fortunately for us, the weather was bad this spring, so we couldn't get the work done. So we said, we'll do this first. If it doesn't work, we'll go the other route. Well, we've started working on this method, and the water is clearing up. And the difference between costs is from 1.2 million to $250,000. So it's going to save the community a lot of money, and we're going to do it in a sustainable way. 
Well, we're out of time today. Zary Santner, uh, we thank you very much for your service to our city and for your obvious passion and commitment to this great park system that we are so lucky to have because of the people that went before us all. We'll see you next week. We are adjourned.